Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, thank you for coming. This is the last presentation of the day. Uh, Mike Cruz from KDAP will be speaking about interacting with 3D content. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming. Last uh, talk uh, in the track about uh, 3D graphics. Um, I'm, through, I'm sure you're all as tired as I am, so thanks for coming. Uh, and we are indeed going to talk about interacting with 3D content and mostly in the, content, in the context of Qt 3D. So I'll spend a, a bit of time talking, you know, why are we talking about this in the first place, and then I'll uh, talk a little bit, very, you know, two slide about what is Qt 3D just mostly so we have a common set of uh, ideas about what we're talking about. And then we'll discuss how you handle um, input devices, you know, mouse events, keyboard events, uh, and then how you can add uh, potential uh, controls uh, inside your user interface and how do then you mix 3D content and 2D traditional interaction content. Okay, so we're talking about things you can do today in current releases of Qt 3D. Uh, on desktop and on mobile applications. Potentially, uh, as the previous talk has highlighted, some of these things may be extended for uh, handling interaction in VR, uh, but this is what we have here today. So why this talk, why are we talking about this uh, in the first place? Well, uh, um, Qt3D introduces a third input handling stack, okay? So if you're familiar with widgets, you know how to handle events with widgets. If you're familiar with QML, you know it's another way of doing it with mouse areas and all of that. Q3D introduces yet another uh, input handling stack of how you handle all of these uh, mouse keyboard events. The, so you need to learn how this works. Uh, the other problem is that uh, there's also a third dimension. You're thinking in 3D space, not 2D user, 2D user interfaces. Um, so that introduces some problems um, that were going to come uh, obvious when we go through some of the uh, examples. Um, the other point was also alluded uh, in the, the previous talk is that there's no, uh, in 3D space, there's no existing tool set. There's no widgets for doing buttons. There's no uh, the quick controls. Um, so it's up to you to build everything. So you need to know what the building blocks um, are for that. And also we have very little uh, at least in a QT world, we have very little uh, user experience in what makes a good or a bad uh, user interface for interacting with 3D. Um, so we're trying, gonna try and explore some of those uh, questions during this talk. So what's Qt 3D? Qt 3D is not necessarily about, Q3, about 3D only, but it's a, a, a multi-purpose engine to handle um, simulation. Um, just going to you know go very go through that some of the input the important um, things that we're going to go through here is that uh, the API for Qt3D has a notion of a scene graph so an entity roughly speaking it's an object that can have a uh, transformation and position in space and it can have some um, uh, geometry which basically gives it. Uh, its uh, physical appearance and some materials which will give it some color or some uh, texturing. Um, uh, and that's how you basically build your scene. All of these can be organized in the hierarchy um, and uh, basically um, assembled into a larger scene. Okay, So just a very rough idea about what constitutes an object in, in Qt 3D. And we're going to talk about how you interact with these objects. Uh, something you would not necessarily have in the 2D world, but in 3D, you need it's important to consider where it is that you are looking at your scene from. So there's a notion of a camera which uh, controls where you, the observer is relative to the objects. Okay, so uh, a very um, um, simple um, scene in, um, in Qt 3D. Uh, here, so if I have run the example very quickly, this uh, lovely donut. So you've got some geometry, you've got some texturing, something that gives the, the, the appearance to the, uh, to the object. And then you have a, a camera, which I can then interact with to look at the objects from various angles. All right, and if I put very look at how, uh, quickly look at how this is put together, 
Um, you have an entity, which is the, the notion represents r roughly an object, and that it's put together, assemble various components. That's the torus mesh, the donut. All of these is the material that give it its appearance, and then the transform that puts it uh, into space. All right, and then that's the camera here, and that's the uh, controller that lets me manipulate the, the camera, okay? Uh, one thing important to know about Q3D, this is all expressed in QML, of course. As you will see now, there's a uh, similar uh, API in C++, so you can write your programs in both, and you have the same functionality. Right, I'm only going to show QML for the, this talk because uh, it's easier to understand and less, less verbose. Right? So you have a very rough idea of uh, how you put things together. Uh, um, object scenes, and uh, we're going to look at how you do the interaction with these objects. Now, the first thing you need to do when you interact with 3D objects is picking. It's basically, given the position of the mouse on the screen, is identify which object is underneath the uh, cursor um, in order to be able to um, interact with it. So, in order to do that, we use a, a component that's called a object picker, okay? And that needs, uh, that's got, basically will receive, uh, implicitly will receive the mouse events. And uh, every time there is a mouse event, it will do a picking in the scene. What that means is that it will construct array that goes from the position of the camera uh, to, into the scene, and it will try and find all the objects that intersect that ray. Okay? Um, and um, based on intersection, it will then generate events. So if there is an object, the object picker will emit an event that says, okay, the mouse was pressed on this uh, object, or the mouse was released, or the mouse has moved if you have drag enabled, and so on. Okay? Um, the object picker also has a, a property called contains mouse, which basically has the uh, traditional QML more declarative way um, um, to do uh, binding compared to using um, events. Um, every event uh, that you're going to receive, so very uh, briefly, if I look at it um, in the object picker, here, so uh, if I run this example, okay, so we have two spheres, and you'll notice that when my mice go, uh, gets over the sphere, they change color, and if I press the mouse, they'll change size, okay? And the way this is done is by creating a scene with uh, two of these pickable entities, uh, which are basically entities that uh, have a mesh, a material, and a transform that puts them in, in the scene, and they have an object picker. Okay, the object picker is here, and then basically the object picker has uh, pressed, released, entered, exited, or clicked event uh, that gets generated when the uh, picking is successful. Okay, in this case, we're just uh, forwarding the signals outside, and then in the main, um, we have a press color, Harvard color, so basically just you know, listening to events and changing bindings and things like that. Um, some things about uh, controlling the picking is that uh, there is a, basically an object or a component that you can attach usually to the root of your scene graph called um, a component called uh, render settings um, that can be used to control the rendering, but it also has um, a property called picking settings that controls exactly how picking uh, uh, occurs. So by default, what happens when you do a picking is that the mouse event gets, um, gets collected and then they get sent to the back end of uh, Qt which will then um, do the ray casting operation, calculate the ray and do the ray casting operation. 
The default is to do what's called bounding volume picking. So basically every object, it'll create its, find its bounding sphere and see if the ray intersects that sphere. The reason it does that is that this is very cheap, okay? Uh, but if you want precise picking in identifying exactly on what point of the object you've, uh, you were picked, uh, you can also uh, do a triangle-based picking. And that will actually tell you which of the triangles, because all objects tend to be made of triangles, uh, which of triangles was actually picked, um, and what are the coordinates of the point that was actually uh, clicked on. Okay? Since Qt, uh, well, in Qt 5.10, when that is released, you'll also get point-based and line-based uh, picking that you can enable here. Also, by default, when you do picking, you only get an event for the object for, that has an object picker um, that is the closest to the camera, okay? So if you have five objects um, that are all behind where you're looking at them, they're all behind each other, when you do a picking, you will only get an event for the closest. Okay, you can also, you can actually disable that and ask to have all the picking events, uh, all the pickers uh, be triggered one by one. Okay, so that's picking settings. Um, and yeah, briefly here at the bottom, you'll see the, the objects, the information you can get, you can receive uh, when you get a, an actual picking, like uh, what the position on the screen was, uh, that's the X and Y of the mouse, and then what the local intersection to the object in is in the uh, coordinate system of the object, and what the world intersection is for that uh, picking point. Pick settings I um, yeah, mentioned just previously. And just a very simple example of how you can uh, put that uh, into practice. If I run here, um, so I have these three boxes. Uh, one of them has the focus, this is the largest one, and basically I can click on the object to give it a focus. And also, so if I just click, it'll give it the focus, but if I press and then drag, I uh, tracking the movement of the drag point and then tra changing the position of the object uh, accordingly. Okay, so the setup for this is uh, very similar to the previous object where you got an object. Um, yeah, it's not the right one. That's why it's so similar. Uh, the box entity. Here you've got a cuboid, so that's the box. You've got a transform um, with uh, a changing on the translation and on the scale, depending on whether the box has a focus or not. Um, and some material, and then the object picker. And when we click, basically we emit a click signal uh, for the box, which uh, in the main scene will just set the for the current box, we'll set the focus to true and then unfocus the other two boxes. Okay, and then the actual position, uh, the transformation is actually operated in here. All right, so very simple uh, way of doing uh, interactions in the, in the scene. Um, now, what we're doing in this case is that we are directly uh, modifying an object uh, in response to event to mouse events. Okay, um, what if you want to use mouse event, but not necessarily not necessarily in the context of picking? Okay, you might want to use mouse event to control, for example, the way the camera moves. So you're not picking a camera; you're actually moving the mouse on the screen, and you want to compute some transformation based on that. So in order to do that, uh, we uh, need to use a sort of a separate uh, set of classes uh, and use what's called physical device. Okay, so we have a keyboard device and a uh, mouse device, and that's basically just a source of events, right? Um, but a device on its own doesn't do anything. It's just uh, a source of events. In order to do actually do something, you need to connect a, a device to an actual input handler. 
Uh, so Qt3D comes with a, a, a couple of handlers. There's a keyboard handler and the mouse handler. And you attach them to an entity. You associate a phys physical device to it. And then you can handle the events and do uh, some things uh, uh, related to the events that you receive. All right, so a simple example. Run. So here, if I left click anyway, anywhere in my scene, I'm going to set one texture. And if I right click, I'm going to set another texture. All right, so the way this is done is uh, mouse handler. Oops, box entity. Uh, it's in the main scene. Okay, so we have a mouse device, and then we have an entity with a mouse handler, and then we handle the uh, on release event. And for the left button, we set a certain uh, texture, and for the right button, we set another one. Okay, so that's just a way of using events, not necessarily related to picking. Um, and then there's um, another example of using the keyboard handler for the same thing. If I run this. Uh, so there, basically, I'm just using the arrows of my keyboard to uh, control the position of the object, right? Um, and basically here, um, what we're going to do is change, uh, evolve our, the example we were seeing with the three box to actually um, combine our picking with the events that we were having previously. So if I run this now, Um, basically, here I'm moving uh, the the, uh, the box that has the focus with my keyboard um, uh, arrows, and I can still change the focus using uh, by clicking on an object to explicitly set it the focus. But then I can also use the tab key to uh, circle the to cycle the the focus from one object to the next. And I also have page up, page down which uh, toggles the rotation on the object. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so that shows very briefly, I'll go back at the code. QML. So I have a keyboard device here. I have my three box entities. And then they've been, uh, um, basically, we define some signals on them. When, when tab is pressed on them, their focus becomes true. Um, and uh, when they're clicked on them, the focus also becomes true. And then the entities themselves will have the object picker to handle the clicking and the, the moving that we're doing before. And then I'll have the keyboard handler to handle up, down, left, right um, buttons. Okay? And then the tab to um, the tab key to change the focus around. All right. Um, now, the, uh, so this is good to uh, handle these discrete events. Um, when you uh, handle events, though, especially in some contexts like games and things like that, rather than having discrete events, you, um, it becomes quite interesting to have more um, logical events that basically have a value that changes over time. So if you think about controlling a game uh, uh, and using uh, sort of uh, um, your remote, you're going to have discrete events, but your, your ship will tend to move not jump from for under each event, but you want it to change smooth, smoothly uh, and have these um, changes in properties um, change smoothly over time. 
Um, so lo that's what logical devices uh, let you do. They basically have um, an analog view, an analog view uh, of a physical device, and you can also aggregate several of them uh, in a device, unified device, and that's quite useful for handling uh, gaming remotes and things like that. So Qt3D has also a built-in support for Qt Remote, um, the, the library to support things like PS3 and Xboxes uh, remotes or the made-for-Apple um, gaming remotes. So, um, in order to do that, you need to uh, define actions, right? So, um, Uh, sorry, I'm collapsing a little bit, and I was looking for logical input. So if I run this example here, um, I have a uh, box entity, and that's uh, basically the behavior is going to be controlled by a controller here. Um, and then we have some, uh, basically some animation, but the controller in this case is going to take a keyboard device, and then is going to basically take a discrete event from the device, and um, uh, handle uh, actions that are defined here. So um, it's looking for input actions that if you uh, hit space or return, then it's going to trigger the, uh, an active flag on the action. Okay, so here, if I hit space or if I hit return, I'm toggling between two uh, textures. So here I have an input action and um, when the action is actually active, I'm going to toggle the material. Okay. Another uh, type of action you can do is, is uh, input chords. So that's to handle a combination of buttons. Okay. So if I type on Q then and on W uh, at the same time, so I have a chord uh, which is uh, input action, uh, the key, the Q key and the W key. And if I press the two together, that basically uh, changes the size. Another thing is to have an input sequence where basically you want uh, events to happen in a certain order within a certain interval. Um, and basically if I type Z then X, Normally, it should happen. Yeah, it starts spinning. There's a timeout, so sometimes I'm too fast, sometimes I'm too slow. Probably too slow at this time of day. Um, and if, um, so there I'm starting some behavior by hitting, uh, hitting these two keys, and if I do it in the other way around, uh, I'm going to stop the rotation, okay? So this basically lets you combine, uh, build some behavior based on a combination of keys, something that is quite, in here on the keyboard, it's uh, only moderately, moderately uh, interesting, but on, if you think about using uh, controls for gamer control, it's uh, quite common to have things uh, like using multiple keys on a remote. Okay. Another thing you can do on top of this is to use input axes and that causes the value, uh, values to uh, uh, interpolate over time. Let me close some of these. Um, <clears throat> so here, my controller for uh, my cube is going to have a um, logical device and it's going to have button axes. Uh, which have a, a, an acceleration and a deceleration. So it's basically taking a value that's going to uh, initially be zero and then can vary between minus one and one and it has an acceleration and a deceleration when, you, when you know, the event stops and it needs to fall back to zero. So uh, here, 
if I run this, and I do the up key, I'm going to scale the, uh, the cube. So I have a value that starts from zero, and I have the up key, and as long as I keep it up, it linearly goes up to one, and if I let it go, it goes down to zero. So that has the acceleration to go up and deceleration to go down. S same thing uh, to go from uh, the default value down to zero. Okay, so that basically gives a smooth uh, uh, interpolation over time uh, for your, uh, for handling from your discrete input events. Um, so here, when we, when we were moving the box in the previous example, using the arrows, the box would jump from one position to the, to the next. So what we can do in this case is have that interpolation uh, happen over time. So here you see my, my, my box is moving, is sliding across, it's not jumping in steps. Uh, and it's going, and when I start print, uh, pressing the button, it goes faster and faster. And then when I let it go, it slows down with some de deceleration. Okay. And it's the same thing for rotating, for rotating the box. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the things in the code for uh, this third step here is that all the code that, um, so that's my controllers, uh, my axis inputs here. Um, but basically the code that accumulates the changes in the position or in the rotation, all of that is driven by these um, operations here, okay? Which means all the calculations are done in QTs and QML's main thread. Right? So that, in this particular case, it's not uh, hugely problematic, but uh, maybe it would be a better idea for, to let all this uh, uh, accumulation and these transformation happen uh, directly inside Qt's uh, threaded backend. So in order to do that, uh, we can use an axis accumulator. Okay, so it does all the uh, managing of the value uh, over time um, and the uh, adding all the, the increments or decrements to the value, and that's all is done um, on the QT's uh, secondary threads, which means it leaves your main thread uh, completely uh, responsive for updating the display or handling other events. Um, Okay, so basically you still have your logical device that we saw uh, previously, uh, and then we add an axis uh, accumulator, which is responsible for um, tracking the, the values, uh, and it emits basically a new value that you can then ma manipulate. So this is what um, the last example does. The idea now here is this, this information, this animation is actually much is smoother than the previous case because everything is done in the background. And also uh, because it can accumulate over a range that's not limited to uh, minus one and one, it means if I do the rotation uh, in the previous case, the value would just basically stop at one, which would uh, the, the rotation would basically only rotate by, um, I forget if it's 90 degrees or 180 degrees, but here in this case, I can keep the spinning going on and on because the accumulator is all done in the background uh, for you. Okay, so this animation is all done much more smoother, all from the back end threads. All right. Um, so that's basically all the uh, basic ways that you have in Qt 3D uh, in order to handle your user interaction. So the object picker, if you know, need to know that the mouse events occurred on a specific object, and if you need to operate on the discrete mouse and keyboard events, then you have the input devices and the input handlers that we just saw. 
All right. Another thing that you might want to do is combine your scene uh, with more traditional 2D user interfaces. Okay, so in order to do that, you have a um, ent uh, an entity in Qt Quick that's called uh, Scene 3D, um, and basically that basically you give it a Qt 3D scene graph and it renders it inside the item, which means you can then in put that inside your QML scene in any way that you would want, and. Um, uh, basically create um, user interfaces such as this. Okay, so you have a cute 3D scene embedded inside a cute quick scene and because they're all in the same QML world, the cute quick can directly modify the properties of the uh, cute 3D interfaces and uh, run them as you wish. Okay, so there's very uh, simple examples that actually ship with Creator. Um, if you've been on the QT booth at previous uh, World Summit, you will uh, probably will have seen demos like this one, like the car demo here. So this is a Qt uh, 3D scene with all the fancy PBR rendering, um, but it's embedded in a, a Qt Quick user interface, which means you can do the traditional QML of displaying user interfaces here, but the QML has full access to the objects uh, and the entities of Qt3D, which means they can actually go and manipulate them. So in the case of the exploding view, the, your QML can access all the transformations of the entities and um, uh, display them like that, okay? You can just open one of the doors and so on, right? Really, really easy to do. Uh, there's no picking in this particular case, but yes, you can, you can do the, you can do both. Yeah. I'll take more questions at the end if, uh, if there are any. Um, okay, so scene 3D, really example, a really easy way of uh, mixing uh, two traditional the 3D rendering and traditional 2D user interfaces but the user interface is uh, either around or overlaid on top of the 3D. Um, so since 5.9, there's the scene 2D, which basically uh, was also mentioned in the um, uh, previous talk, is how do you embed a QML interface and put it inside your scene? All right, so there's an, um, an example for that. Um, actually, it's still in here. Same game, run. Okay, so this is a 3D scene uh, with an object, uh, a monolith uh, in the middle. And I can never control that one properly. So basically, there's a kind of a brick there and on uh, the side of the brick here, there's a complete, this is the same game example that ships with Qt. This is QML rendered in real time and it's fully interactive. Okay, so I can go and click on here uh, and play same game. Okay, so I'm gonna stop playing. Stop playing, he said. Um, <coughs> uh, but basically here, uh, you're very easy, your traditional QML, uh, and it's completely uh, immersed inside the 3D scene. Now this relies on picking, uh, so basically what happens with this is that there, when you have your scene 2D object, it has a, um, an object picker, and uh, when you click, it will look at what point inside the object uh, you click to, and it will can basically synthesize a 2D uh, event that will then be sent to the QML scene as if it was a regular mouse click uh, for QML world. Okay? Stop playing. Um, uh, so that's basically what C the scene um, 2D uh, does for you. Um, Something that if you've used other 3D toolkits, it's really, really hard to do normally. But because it's all QT, 
And um, although it's different rendering stacks, they're relatively compatible rendering stacks, so it's quite easy um, to do. I'm sure whoever wrote it wouldn't say it was that easy, but uh, it's easy to use at least. Um, right, so that's basically the state of interacting with, um, with you know, 2D and 3D objects currently uh, in, in 3D. And um, just a couple of slides about what it is we're looking at uh, for the future, right? Um, some of the things related to picking that are quite uh, limited right now. Um, firstly, that you can't get the list of all the objects that were picked. So if you have the mode where you get multiple picking, each object picker will receive an event, but um, you can't get the list of all of them in one go, which means if you need that, you, there's no way, you'll, you'll get several events, but there's no way of knowing you've got the last event, basically. So you can't get all the lists, so we need a way around that. There's also no notification that a click happened on the, on the scene, but there was nothing there to be picked. Okay, which is quite sometimes useful um, in order, say, for example, if you are having some kind of context menu when you click on an object, if you want to close it, you need to be able to click away, uh, but the, so there's nothing there, you won't get an event to actually let you dismiss your, your context menu. Yeah, potentially Skybox. Um, another thing that's uh, missing is the event bubbling. Uh, basically, the delegation, the, some, the thing that says that an event was handled, so don't propagate it to the rest of the scene. Uh, in the same game example, it's not really, it doesn't really apply because uh, it's, there's, uh, the same game handles clicks, but the, all the, the mouse press and move handles the camera. But if same game handled move or just press and release, then same game will handle that event and the camera would also handle that event and move. So essentially, if you were going to move, if it was a drawing application rather than same game, drawing on the QML pad would also move the camera, which would be completely uh, bizarre. Um, so the, because the events are essentially different stacks, uh, there's no way uh, currently of saying the event was handled by same game or by the QML interface, so don't handle it for the camera, right? Another reason for this is that the event handling in QQuick 3D is actually asynchronous. Uh, it's, uh, it copies the event, with, it then goes to the background thread. Um, so e even for your own application, um, if you wanted to know whether Q3D had handled the event or not, you would have to wait until there was some, some reply coming back. Um, also, the picking itself currently uh, is limited to actual um, mouse events, okay? Internally, it's a ray scene intersection code, but there's no way of saying, given a X and Y coordinate on my screen, is there anything there? And there's also no way of doing the generalized picking. So if you were going to do a VR interface that was alluded to in the previous talk about having this wand that would let you click on uh, objects, currently you couldn't do, there's no user uh, API to do that. It's all hidden in the back end. So we'll think about uh, providing support for that. Um, support for more controllers, especially related to VR. Um, so uh, Andy, uh, previously related, related to a, a work in progress patch. So that's something that was done by uh, my colleague Paul here. Uh, and it does handle the headset. Um, uh, but it doesn't provide any support for actually showing the controllers that you may have uh, for it and then um, do interaction based uh, with that. And then there were some questions about uh, audio and how you might associate with that. They could also have questions about haptic feedback. A lot of the mouse, the game controllers can vibrate. Uh, can we associate input with haptic is of course it's an output, uh, but is the way of associating with that. Also, can we combine this with uh, physics or collision detection when you move objects? You know, if you're doing something like a scene editor, you want to be able to put something down on a table and not have it you know, drop to the floor or um, basically hover some one centimeter about it. You want to know 
it's on the table. So one of the things that we're going to look at uh, related to this is the concept of manipulator. So one of the things we're interacting with 3D content is that when you move objects around in the scene, for those cubes it was really easy because I'm moving them on the ground. But if I wanted to stack my two cubes and put you know, one cube on top of the other, it becomes really complicated. First, because it's difficult to, when you move the mouse in the 2D plane of your screen, it's difficult to say in the 3D world, where is that plane? And actually, I want to really move more in my, the, the flat uh, surface or in the XY plane or, or whatever the uh, plane you might want to control in. Um, so uh, basically, the idea in order to work this, this has been a long uh, running problem since we've been done 3D application. And many applications will introduce something called uh, manipulators, which is basically something that insert into the scene in order for you to uh, constrain the, um, the, the dis displacement of the object. So for example, in, in Blender, you have these manipulators that get manipulated, that get uh, inserted, and if you click uh, on one of the arrows, you're constrained to moving the cube just in that one direction, okay? Uh, similarly, uh, for uh, scaling uh, or for rotation, if you click on one of these objects, and you can imagine combining them or remove some degrees of freedom depending on the type of application uh, you want to do. Now, the thing related to all of this is that you really want to combine picking and the traditional, the low-level input handling. Because, for example, if um, if I run, uh, say, the cube, the first example here, okay, if I move about the cube, um, I'm or this is solely based on the object picker. Okay, so it's when when you move, I'm moving the cube. Well, that means that my movements only, the, my mouse movements only work as long as my mouse pointer is on the cube. If I go too fast, I've lost my, my, my mouse pointer and the cube hasn't followed it. Um, so basically, we only really want picking um, to decide whether we act, start act, uh, interacting with an object, but then we just want to look at the uh, mouse events to continue the interaction. The same principle when you manipulate a scroll bar in an application. Uh, here, I click on the scroll bar to start moving, but then my mice pointer doesn't have to remain in the scroll bar to continue moving. But you've defined a, uh, an action that you're going to start manipulating. So we want to combine the picker and the uh, input handling to, um, to build these manipulators, as well as adding geometry and making it uh, easier to, um, to interact. So some of the other problems you might have uh, when you do this kind of thing, so here I have a, an object here, and I have this little cylinder which basically helps me control the, the radius of the cone. So if I click on it, this uh, uh, changes the, the value of the cone, uh, the, uh, the bottom radius of the cone. Uh, this has the, the problems that is still only based on the object picker. So as soon as I move out, it doesn't move anymore. But uh, you want to be able to still drag it even though you're interacting and going through, through another object. You also want to make sure that when I'm interacting with this, I'm actually no longer interacting with a camera, all that kind of behavior that you have to build in to these controls that we need to build for the 3D world. So that's something we're, talking, we're uh, thinking about and looking at building for a future uh, version of Qt 3D. And I believe that's it for this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, sorry, he's, he's okay. giving the microphone to somebody else. Up to you next. Sorry. <laughs> um, a couple of questions. How does Qt3D handle uh, changing geometry? Is that easy to accomplish, or? Um... Uh, well, it's, yeah, it's outside the 
the scope of this talk, but yes, it's very easy yeah. to, to change the, the geometry of the object. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, would it be possible to solve the object picking limitation by embedding the, well, by overlaying a 2D scene that actually captures the events depending on where you clicked in the underlying 3D scene? It's order, kind of a for, hack. For, for the event bubbling, you mean? Or yeah, for, so that if you uh, move your mouse cursor outside of the 3D object that you still actually are still moving in your 2D scene. Yeah, uh, that is probably one way of doing it. I think it's probably more because of the asynchronous nature of the event handling in Qt3D. I'm pretty sure that wouldn't be the, the, the best way of doing it. Um, so yeah, we we'll, we'll still need to investigate that, uh, what the, the best way of handling this. So. Are there any plans to mix in states and animations into entities? Because they very well work for items, but they awfully work because they are not synchronized with 3D. Uh, the state handling? Yeah. Uh, so you can, may have somewhere an item that then has uh, states and transitions, uh -huh. and then you have some, somewhere a property that is like the rotation yeah. uh, angle, whatever. But um, uh, the combination of the two is so asynchronous that it is because it's not running on the graphics uh -huh. thread uh, that it actually jitters. Yeah, uh, that's quite possible that the existing situation is like that. There's some work that we're working on, some things we are working on that potentially would let you express states um, or changes in properties at least in the backend thread. Uh, which means everything would be driven by Qt3D backend engine and then remain all all synchronous. Um, so that's probably something that's um, coming along at some point later on. But yeah, I see how it potentially can be problematic now. But Could you find a jury, please? I'm not. <laughs> no, no, you can still. Yeah. yeah, if you have a sample, a sample scene that a sample scene that exhibits that uh, behavior would be useful. Any more questions? I there was a question there. So I'd like to know um, how does uh, Qt3D scale with the number of entities mean? What's, what are the bounds? Uh, well, if you look at the, some of the demos we have now, it's, you know, it's, it's typically it's the difficult question to answer because uh, what does it mean and what context, which machine, and so on. Um, Qt3D in terms of the rendering does uh, view frustrum culling, so it will only render the items that um, you see in front of you. Uh, but if you create a million entities, especially uh, you know, the, that's a million objects mm -hmm. with a geometry and then there's uh, all of that, there's no, um, currently nothing that will, uh, for example, let you gradually load some data or page in data and page out data that you would have typically if you were doing like a navigating inside a, uh, a whole world model or things like that. So, yeah, there is, there is um, some support for like you know, I was saying, you know, vfrost from culling, uh, but we don't do occlusion culling or, or that kind of thing. But that question is the same for, you know, how does it happen? How, how do QML scenes, if you have millions of items, they, yeah, it doesn't really scale. So it's up to you to handle your scene to also um, load items when only when they're needed and so on. It's a very vast uh, problem. So there's some tools also to, like, level of details to handle multiple representation of an object so that only the closer, the, the, the the most satisfying geometry for a given distance is, is displayed, that kind of thing. But that only also means more items because for one object you have multiple of representations. Uh, even if they are like simple spheres? Yeah, like but... A million uh, spheres. Uh -huh. that, that, that is the sort of question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, you can do it, but it depends on yeah, what hardware, how they're all uh, organized, how the how scene is organized. It's very... You, there's, you can't understand. I can't reply with one number. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you again, Mike. Thank and you. And I want to thank everyone for coming out.